pretty excited about my uh, first guest. His name is Marvin Elkin, and there's a book about him called The Weasel. And uh, Marvin's 85 years old. Now, this book is all-encompassing. covers his early life, his connections to uh, the mob through Jimmy Hoffa, the fact that he was a driver for Jimmy Hoffa, the fact that he was a driver for Muhammad Ali, and the fact that he was an informant for the Ontario Provincial Police, which for you Americans out there is the equivalent to the state police. You know what, Marvin? Uh, I picked you up to drive you here, and uh, we're not going to cover the whole book. So Whatever you say. From, well, considering the fact that it took you 10 minutes to get from the curb to my passenger door, I want you to promise me you're going to live long enough to come back. I'll do my best. Yeah, you're 85. All right. Now, uh, you have had what I consider to be the most fascinating life, at least as far as Canada is concerned, that I ever heard of. It's an incredible story, uh, even starting with your childhood. Your uh, father was a bank robber, right? So they tell me. Yeah, so they tell you. And uh, by the way, that means you came to your criminal life pretty honestly. I mean, you know, my dad was in retail. I think your life was way more fascinating than mine when I was that age. Uh, and when you were nine years old, your stepfather kind of sold you down the river and had you go to a foster family, right? Correct. And you formed some lifelong relationships there with uh, your foster brother, Roy, who was a nasty piece of work. Tough guy. Tough guy. What did he do for a living? Roy was a fence. If people don't know what that means, he means he bought and sold, bought and sold stolen goods. Yeah. And he was a loan shark. Right. Now he was a pretty smart guy. He also did did some investing in real estate. Right. Now you lost your virginity at nine. Nine years old. I lost it when I was nine. Yeah. So this would be what. Uh... 1939, I guess, or 40, in the 40s? 43. 1943, lost your virginity at the age of nine. Now, you say it was pretty traumatic, but let me uh, explain something to you. I lost my virginity at 20, which to me is a lot more traumatic than losing it when you're nine. You know what I mean? At least you felt attractive. But unfortunately, it was to your foster mother. I didn't feel attractive. I was scared. Yeah. And I was embarrassed. Right. And I hated it. These are all the emotions I had the first time I had sex at 20. So, again, cry me a river. Uh, now, you got out of that situation. You cruised into adulthood. And uh, the first thing I want to talk about is how you met Jimmy Hoffa. I met Jimmy Hoffa this way. My foster brother, Roy, yeah. took another foster brother, Rudy, who was a uh, Canadian contender in boxing. Right to New York to fight. When he was there, he rented a house. He turned into a rooming house. And he called me in Toronto to come down there and uh, spend some time with him down there. He'd get me a few fights. Right. And uh, could get me a job at Stillman's Gym doing maintenance. Right. Because you were a boxer yourself, a pretty tough guy. I wasn't bad. Yeah. I, I wasn't great. I won more than I lost. Right. I went down to New York, and I, I had a few fights, and I did some maintenance work at Stillman's, and I needed some extra money, so I met somebody at Stillman's that got me a job as a busboy at the Copacabana. Now, you were at the Copacabana at the same time as Tony the Lip. Vigo Mortensen played him in the movie The Green Book, but you were at the Copacabana at the same time as Tony the Lip, right? Same time. Yeah. Now, he was kind of a fringe mob guy, right? Well, according to him, he was more than a fringe guy. Yeah, but he was a bouncer at the Copa. He was a part-time maitre d' and a bouncer. Now, was he as tough as he's made out to be in the movie? Yes, he is. Really? He yeah, was? A tough, yeah. tough guy. Yeah, and eventually he went on to uh, a job in The Sopranos as an actor. That guy's life was... He's kind of like the American version of you. I mean, he was involved with a lot of people, and uh, you know, for him there was a bigger payoff in the end. But basically, he was the flip. Uh, he was the American version of you. So in fact, he was a nice guy. I liked him. Yeah. And uh, so, how did you get introduced to Hoffa? I was working at the Copa, and Mr. Hoffa's people—Frankie Carbo, Blinky Palermo. 
Tony Pro Provenzano and Tony Salerno used to come in for. You know, I hear those four names and I go, "How did it take so long to figure out that Hoffa was with the mob?" <laughs> That's. It's incredible to me that it took so long for people to catch up. You know. Yeah. So they were there. They used to come four or five times a week because they didn't pay. Right. It was free for them at the Copa. Now, they got a big kick out of scaring people. Right. People, uh, waiters or waitresses or busboys used to come over, and they used to yell at them. Right. Now, they knew they, who they were. They knew people were scared, and they just got a big kick out of it. But I knew they were just there to have a good time, and they were big tippers. Yeah. So while everybody ran away from them, I ran towards them. Right. Because I knew they weren't going to do anything. They were just there. That was their way. They were enjoying themselves, and I wasn't scared of them. And I went there, and I would, uh, they were big tippers. One day I'm there. It was on a Wednesday. Yeah. And Tony Salerno calls me, and he goes, Hey, little Jew boy, get over here. Little Jew boy. Uh, what a uh, sucky mob name. Okay. <laughs> little Jew boy. Okay. Well, he used to see me when he used to go to some of the fights, and I wore a Star of David on my trunks and on the back of my robe. Right. So I knew. Yeah. So I went over, and I said, Yes, Mr. Salerno. So he says, We spoke to... Lou Walters, Barbara Walters' father, Lou, owned the Copa. Right. He said, Which a lot of people don't know, by the way. That's a pretty amazing story in itself. And, uh, Lou Walters owned it. He said, we spoke to Lou Walters. Friday's your last day here. So I said, why? I'm trying to... By the way, there's a few things scarier than a mob guy saying last day. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter where you are. When a mob guy says last day... That didn't scare me. Yeah. What scared me was this. He said, we spoke to Lou Walters. I said, why? I'm trying to so hard to do a good job. He says, as of Monday, you're going to be Mr. Jimmy Hoffa's driver. Now, what position did Hoffa hold at that time? International president. So he was the president at that time. Yes. Right? So I said, I don't want to be Hoffa's driver. He says, nobody's asking you. I said, but I'm a Canadian. He says, that's the whole idea. Hoffa's yeah. driver has just been drafted into the Army. You being a Canadian, we don't have to worry about that. Right. And you're going to be his driver. I what year was this? 1952. Okay. So he was drafted into the Army for Korea. He, he was. Yeah, okay. So I said to him, I said, well, I'm Canadian. I don't know the city. He says, Hoff is a, he's, uh, goes ahead, he does the same things. You go to the same places every day. We'll right. take you around and you'll have no trouble knowing exactly where to go. Right. As of Monday, you're going to be Jimmy Hoffa's driver. Now, how old were you then? 18. Oh, man. I was scared. Once again, to point out, this is uh, at 18, that's two years before I lost my virginity. Two years before I lost mm -hmm. my virginity. At 18, you're a driver for Jimmy Hoffa. Mm -hmm. What happened was, on the weekend, I was in my room. This was a Sunday. Yeah. I had to start the next day. Now, on Saturday, they picked me up, and they took me out, and they took me to a store called Little David's, Right. and they bought me a coat and a hat, three blazers, six pair of slacks, right. six sport shirts, half as drivers, and they took me to a jewelry store, and they bought me this gold chain that I got the Star of David on. Right, so they wanted you to look sharp. Well, they wanted me to look sharp, and half as drivers were not allowed to wear shirts and ties. You had to wear an open sport shirt right. so that gold chain could be shown that showed you it was a slave. What do you mean a slave? It's exactly what they said. This it was a this gold chain, which is a rope chain, yeah. shows your office slave that has to be visible at all times. No kidding, huh? Right. So they took me around, they took me to LaGuardia. Yeah. They showed me where Hoffa comes in on Monday morning from his hometown, where I pick him up. And they gave me all the instructions. They showed me where I pick up the car. And they took me to the Lowe's Midtown Hotel. They got me a room there. They said, this is where you're going to live. This is where the offices are at the Lowe's Midtown. Right. Mr. Hoffa had a, an apartment there. Yeah. And each of the two bodyguards each had a room there. Did they tell you what they were going to pay you? I was going to be paid the exact price of a of a truck driver. Okay, a Stay teamster, money. a teamster member. I had it now to be a member of the to work at the Copa. 
you had to be a teamster. Right. So I was already a teamster. Okay. So there was no problem. So they gave it. you the teamster rate to be his driver. The truck driver rate. Right. Now, on Sunday, I was in my room. I hadn't moved into the hotel yet. And I was thinking about it. And I only knew about Mr. Hoffa from reputation. And I was scared to death. His rep even then was uh, scary? His rep was very scary. Scary people around him. Bad things happened to people that he didn't like. A lot of it is not true, but you don't know. Right. And I was scared to death. I phoned my mother. And I said, Ma, this is what happened. Can I come home? Right. She says, no, you can't. She says, your stepfather won't let you come home. You can't come here. And then if you come home, people will say that you were scared. You went to New York on your own and you couldn't handle it. Right. You can't come home. So I made up my mind. So Monday, basically your mom was pro-Hoffa and anti-you. <laughs> my mother was pro her first husband. Right, okay. My stepfather. Right, okay. So I went ahead. The next day, I went to a gas station. The car was waiting. I picked up the car. It was Cadillac. A, it was a beautiful black four-door black Cadillac broom. The big one. Oh, the brome, yeah. I went to LaGuardia, and I drove where Mr. Hoffa would be coming out. I saw him. I knew what he looked like. They showed me pictures. I saw Mr. Hoffa come off. I pulled the car over, and I got out of the car, and I opened up the door, and I said, Good morning, Mr. Hoffa. Yeah. He says, Are you Marvin? I goes, Yes, sir. He says, You're off to a very good start. Mr. Hoffa or sir? Remember that. Yeah. We all know what true crime is, but what about untrue crime? The true stories of innocent people whose lives have been ripped apart and who have not been allowed to tell their stories until now. Listen to Untrue Crime on the Possibly Correct Network as Diana Davison sheds light onto cases where reputations have been ruined, careers have been destroyed, and countless lies have been told. Find out what really happens when the finger of blame points to someone who's innocent. Subscribe to the Untrue Crime Podcast by going to www.untruecrimepodcast.com and follow the show on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Minds.com and Gab for all the latest news and releases. You can check out all of our podcasts by following Possibly Correct on Minds.com. Now back to the podcast. Funny, huh? Because the guy uh, wasn't aristocratic at all. I mean, he was a working stiff. He was a working who stiff. Who clawed his way to the top. But he wanted respect and fear from his employees. Right. Actually, he wanted it from a lot of people, and, I guess. Well, that was his way he, he handled things. Right. He got into the back of the car. Well, it's the old story, right? You can start out being a bastard and turn into a nice guy later. You can't do the opposite. You can't be a nice guy and then turn into a bastard. I, I've never seen that happen. No, neither have I. So he told me, he says, drive over there. Show me where to drive. I got over. Two guys came out. Yeah. They got into the back of the car with Mr. Hoffa. And he said, Marvin, pull the car over. I pulled it over. He said, now shut the motor off. I shut it off. He says, now turn around. I turned around. And both guys with them opened up their clothes and showed me they were carrying guns. Right. He says, now Marvin, I've got rules and I've got cardinal rules. Right. If you break a rule, these boys will beat the heck crap out of you. Right. He says, if you break a cardinal rule, you won't be around the next morning. Right. He says, here's the rules. I don't want to hear rainstorm, snowstorm, thunderstorm. I don't want to hear any of that. Right. You must never be late when you're picking me up. So in other words, don't ever have a farmer's almanac on the front seat. He said it this way. After you pick me up, if conditions make us late, that's okay. Yeah. But I must never be kept waiting. Those are the rules. Cardinal rules. So it wouldn't matter if you had to drive if you had to pick him up at six and you had to leave at two in the morning to get him, you had to be there when he came out the door. I drove for him for four years. I was an hour early every day. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still a very prompt person. Right. Okay. Yeah, I would be too. Yeah. Yeah. So then he said, Here's the cardinal rules. What you hear in this car stays in this car. Right. And if not, you won't be around until the next morning. Oh, that doesn't really explain the book too well, but okay. <laughs> you know. 
obviously what you heard did not stay in the car, but uh, during the time you were with him, you never opened your yap. By the time, when, all the time I was with him, I did exactly as I was told. Yeah. Who wouldn't? I did. Yeah. And, uh, and it didn't matter who he had in the car, and you must have seen quite a few people go into that car. I saw a lot of people in the car through the conversation. The, the car had no barrier between the front seat and the uh, passenger seat. Right. So I knew who was in the car. I had the head don of New York State, Don Vito Genovese, in the car many right. times. Right. Sam Salvatore Giancana from Illinois was in the car many times. Right. Sinatra's buddy. Uh, Sinatra's buddy, and he also had a showgirl that he took around with him. Right. Albert Anastasia. The enforcer for Murder Incorporated was in the car many times. Don't tell me that. You know, didn't that scare you, Albert Anastasia? The guy was a psychopath. Albert Anastasia was pure evil. He liked to cause trouble. Yeah. I wasn't scared of him because Mr. Hoffa told me not to be. Okay. He says, nothing's going to happen while you're with me. Right. Now, I had Frankie Carbo, Blinky Palermo, Tony Pro Provenzano. They were all in the car at different times. Having all evening. huge mob guys. All huge mob guys. And uh, treated Mr. Hoffa with the greatest of respect. Right. He treated them with respect. Right. I was in the car when uh, Mr. Hoffa made the deal with Don Vito Genovese that Don Vito would supply him muscle men to be on the picket lines. Right. Because the truck company owners had thugs, so I guess Hoffa needed them too. These were guys that were rough, tough guys. They would take ID that belonged to actual truck drivers, but they weren't them, but they would be on the picket lines with their their ID. And the deal was that Mr. Hoffa would loan the mob pension fund money. Right. They always paid him back. He charged him no interest. Right. And they used to put it out in the street at 5% a week. Right. And uh, they would return the principal, but they didn't give him the, what do they call that, the VIG? They kept the VIG for themselves, yeah. but he got the principal back. And that's a pretty sweet deal. It worked well. Mr. Hoffa was sorry after a while that he did that. He tried to get out of it, but they wouldn't let, they wouldn't let him out. How could a guy who was that street smart not realize that once you're in with these guys, you're in with them for life. I heard him tell Don Vito that he was desperate when he made the deal. He didn't realize that he could handle things differently, right. and he wanted out of the deal. Because when he was trying to get the union on his feet, the uh, company owners had so much clout and so much money that there was no way he was ever going to get that union to be what it was without some help. He needed their help, and they gave him the help they they kept their word with them. What's what they did? They right. put the muscle men on the uh, on the picket lines. So what about the rumor that they used pension fund money to build some of the hotels in Vegas and stuff? Is that true? One hundred percent true. Yeah. Now, did the Teamsters get a piece of the hotels, or they just got their money back? The Teamsters did not get a piece of the hotels, but all the member people that worked in the hotels had to join the Teamsters. Right, and they had their conventions there. They had their conventions there. They had birthday parties there. They had everything there yeah. that they didn't pay for. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so he makes all these deals, and then uh, he comes to the attention of uh, Bobby Kennedy in the Kafaver hearings, right? He came to the attention of Bobby Kennedy, and it was supposed to be just business. Yeah. But they took a strong personal dislike to each other. They both had strong dislikes and hates for each other. I've seen the uh, films of the hearings. They hated each other's guts. Hate was a small word for it. Right. Mr. Hoffa used to talk about Bobby Kennedy, how he would do anything to see him dead. And I heard the same thing about Bobby Kennedy about Mr. Hoffa. Right. Kennedy uh, absolutely despised him. And uh, Hoffa despised him uh, due to the fact that he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. And the fact that he was trying to tear down the union. He hated him. He did whatever he could to aggravate him. We would be at the hearings, and Mr. Hoffa would stand up, say, three quarters of the way through, and he used to say, Mr. Kennedy, I'm leaving. 
And Bobby Kennedy used to say, Mr. Hoffa, we're not finished. You can't leave. Right. And he used to turn around. I was always right in back of him. And he used to say, Marvin, bring the car around. Yeah. Yeah. And he used to leave. Why didn't he get held in contempt for that? Never did. We always wondered why. We figured that Bobby Kennedy maybe was told ahead of the time not to. But he never got held in contempt for it. Warned, but never happened. Right. So what was it that finally got him sent to the uh, penitentiary? What got him sent to the penitentiary was called racketeering. Right. And he wouldn't cooperate. He could have kept out, but he wouldn't cooperate. Yeah, I mean, basically, he was a loyal soldier, and he kept his yap shut, right? He was. He had two great passions in life. Yeah. His union. Yeah. He loved his union. He believed in it. He believed he wanted to do the best for his members, and he loved his family. Right. He was a strong family man. At night... So he didn't screw around? He didn't womanize. He yeah. didn't drink. He didn't smoke. He, at nights when it was over and I used to take them back, the other guys used to get ready to go out in the town to different nightclubs because it didn't pay. Right. Mr. Hoffa used to say, Marvin, 9 o'clock, I'll be in the tub, then in bed, have the car around at 7 a.m. Now, every morning, bar none, every morning... Yeah. That car, it could have been raining. It didn't matter what. That car had to be washed every morning and checked for bugs. Yeah. Now, I he used sounds to, a lot like my dad at this point. I had to jump through hoops to get the car. So, so you know exactly how it works. Yeah, yeah. I used to take the car to a gas station every morning, and a police officer used to come with a machine to check to make sure there were no bugs in the car. So it was a corrupt cop. Exactly. Yeah, somebody getting paid off. At, Is there anybody who didn't get paid off in the 50s, by the way? I, I hear about that period, and I go, everybody was getting paid off. Judges, district attorneys, cops. As far as I know, everybody was getting paid off one way or another. Yeah, it, and it was an easy thing to do. It was very easy. Like the cops in Genovese's neighborhood basically kissed his ass, right? And his ring. I never saw them kiss his ring, but I saw him now. When I used to drive Mr. Hoffa, I used to get pulled over by NYPD every single day. They pulled you over every day? Every day. Yeah. I'd be driving, a cruiser would pull up behind me and pull me over. The officer would get out and he'd say, how you doing, Marv? I said, fine. He said, you're speeding. Now, Mr. Hoffa didn't allow me to speed. Right. I used to say, officer, I'm pushing this thing like a baby carriage. Right. He said, oh, so you are. I'm sorry. You're right. Who's that in the back? Is that Mr. Hoffa? Hello, Mr. Hoffa. He said, Marvin, drive on. So what was the point of pulling you over if they were just going to let you go? Strictly for aggravation. But, you know, I don't get it. Why, why aggravate him and not give you the ticket? It happened every day. Yeah. Not one day. But nobody handed the cop, uh, like when you handed him your license, you didn't hand him 40 bucks, 50 bucks to go away? I didn't hand him anything. Really? Including my license. Right. It was just hello and I, goodbye. Hello, hello, Marvin. You're speeding. He says, Officer, I'm pushing this thing like a baby carriage. He says, so you are. We made a mistake. We're sorry. Who's that in the back? Is that Mr. Hoffa? Yeah. Hello, Mr. Hoffa. And he used to say, Marvin, drive on. And this guy never, ever lost it with you. He never lost his temper with you. Who's that? Hoffa. He didn't go nuts on you. You never he, made any mistakes. I never made any mistakes. He always yelled at me. Okay. He never. He used to yell at me. You're going too fast. You should have made that turn. You should have done this turn. Right. He never went nuts on me. He never went psycho. But he used to yell at me all the time. He didn't talk to me. He yelled at me. Now, when these guys were in the back, like Genovese and Provenzano, did you hear them making deals? Oh yes. I heard everything because I was like a piece of the car. Right. They didn't realize I was there. And that's the big thing if you're a driver. you got to become part of, the, uh, you have part of to, the equipment, right? That's all you are. Exactly, and that's what I told uh, Bobby Kennedy when he uh, cross-examined me. Right, because you were called to testify. I was coming out of Stillman's gym where I was working and doing a little sparring. Guy comes up to me, he goes, Marvin Elkin. And I goes, yes, here. Gives me a subpoena to go to Washington to appear before Bobby Kennedy. I bet you're the only Canadian who ever appeared... Uh in front of uh, any Kennedy. 
Other I, than uh, the prime minister, I mean, who else appeared in front of these guys? In that sense, I went to the Teamster lawyer, Mr. Marovitz, and I said, what do I do with this? He said, what do you it's mean? It's funny how the mob guys are always Italian, but when you need a lawyer, they go to the Jews. You notice that? Well, they went to Even the, the mob guys go to the Jews, right? They use the Jews for money, advice, yeah. and legal. Yeah, okay. Uh, Meyer Lansky was a great friend of Mr. Hoffa's. Did you ever meet him? Now, here's what happened. I went to New York. Yeah. I'm sorry. I left New York to go to Miami to fight a fighter called Rocky Castellani. Right. I went there two weeks before the fight. That right. was one good thing working for Mr. Hoffa. When I used to take him to Stillman, he used to have a lot of meetings at Stillman's gym. While he was at the meetings, I could train. Right. And if I had fights coming up, he let me have them. So Hoffa liked the fact that you were a fighter. Uh, he went along with it. Right. Because so, having a driver who can also take care of himself and Hoffa, I mean, it's like you're a combination bodyguard chauffeur, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I'm in Florida. I get yeah. a phone call from Mr. Hoffa. Yeah. He says, Marvin, you're going to get a visit from a very important man. Right. He's going to ask you to do something. I want you to do it. Right. I says, well, Mr. Hoffa, help me out. Who is it? He says, just in case he doesn't come, I'm not going to tell you, but you'll know. Right. I says, well, what's he going to ask? He says, when he asks you, you'll know. Right. Do it. He's a very important man. Right. The fight was at the Fountain Blue Hotel in the parking lot outdoors. Yeah, which is still there today, by the way, the Fountain Blue. Beautiful yeah. hotel. Yeah. I was in the dressing room, sitting down. Two guys come into the dressing room. And they open up their coat to show they're carrying pieces. Right. And they say, everybody out except the little Jew boy and his trainer. Right. I said, what the hell Again, is going on Again, the mob here? named little Jew boy, Again. which really doesn't strike fear in anybody's heart, but okay. Anyway, I'm in there with them. And then they open up the door and they make a signal. And two other big guys come in with a, not a big guy, natalie dressed, right. smoking a cigar. Right. I looked at him and I says to myself, this has got to be either Lucky Luciano or Marlansky. Right. That's what came into my mind. Yeah. He came over to me and he spoke to me in Yiddish. He said, Boychik, that means kid. Yeah. Don't have any Moira. I'm not here to do you any harm. Right. So I immediately said to myself, he's speaking Yiddish. It must be Marlansky. He says, Marvin, do you know who I am? I says, I think you're Mr. Lansky. Right. He says, that's right, I'm Meyer Lansky. Marvin, what city are you in right now? I says, I'm in Miami. He says, who do you think owns Miami? Isn't that what they ask you after you get knocked yeah, out? Yeah, yeah. Like, this guy's asking you this before. He, so he said, who do you think owns Miami? I says, I guess you do. Yeah. He goes, that's right. He says, who are you fighting tonight? I says, Rocky Castellani. He says, who do you think owns Rocky Castellani? I says, I guess you do. Yeah. So he says, how are you going to do? I says, well, he's a very clever boxer but he can't punch. Right. If I get to him, I can knock him out. He can't knock me out. He can't punch that hard. He says, Marvin, how much money are you getting for the fight? I says, 500. Took five $100 bills out of his pocket and put it in the rope, pocket of my rope. He says, now you're getting 1,000. Marvin, it would mean an awful lot to me. We could be friends. You keep the 500. I want you to get knocked out in the first four rounds. Your choice. First right. round, second round, third round, fourth round, it doesn't matter. As long as you don't go bullying on the fourth round. Right. Now, in the Yiddish custom, if somebody dies, the close family say a prayer for him. It's called the Kaddish. Right. So he said to him, he says, Marvin, if you get knocked out in the first four rounds, you keep that money, I'm going to get you a fight in my hotel in uh, Cuba. Right. And I'll treat you real right there. Is that the nasty now? Yes. Yeah. He said, you'll be treated well. Everything will be on the house, the girls, whatever you want. He says, if you don't get knocked out in the first four rounds, make sure you have somebody to say the Kaddish for you. Right. I'll but, tell you, man, this is so Godfather too. Well, I believe them. Yeah. So, Let me ask you this. Did you have the brains at the time to hand somebody 250 of the 500 he gave you and bet against yourself, have somebody go out and bet against you? I was so 
happy to have it over with. I didn't think of anything. Right. I just kept the 500. So how long did it take the guy to knock you out? Now here's what happened. I said to myself, I'll dig my jaw into my shoulder. Right. Let him hit me on the top of the shoulder. I'll fake it and go down and not get hurt. Right. First round, he wouldn't throw the punch. Second round, I couldn't get him to throw the punch. Third round, I couldn't get him to throw the punch. Okay, but now you're freaking. Fourth round is coming up. My trainer, Joy Bagnato, says to me, he says, if you don't get knocked out this round, don't look for me in the corner. I won't be there. Now, in round one, two, and three, are you punching him? I'm jabbing. Right. Most but the crowd's got to be getting pissed because I've seen enough boxing movies to know the crowd gets pissed. crowd was booing like mad. Yeah, yeah. Fourth round, I had no choice. I opened up my jaw directly to him and let him hit me on the jaw. Right. Now, in reality, I wouldn't have gone down. My knees buckled, but I wouldn't have gone down. This way here, I went down. Now, this was an outdoor fight during right. the day. I went down on my back. The sun was in my eyes. Right. I almost covered my eyes with my hand, with my arm. Right. Then I remembered, Jesus Christ. No, you've Christ. been knocked out. You I've can't been do knocked that. Out. Yeah. So I tried to get up, acted like I tried to get up, turned over on my stomach and fell flat down and went down for the count. That's why if you're going to take a fall, you should always wear sunscreen. And uh, you got to know those things. Yeah, you got to know them ahead of time. He yeah. went into the dressing room afterwards, to Mr. Lansky, and he said, when you give up boxing and become an actor, you'll do very well. I'm kidding. That's amazing. So then you go back to uh, driving for Hoffa right after that? Right away, right after the next day. Yeah. Okay. So now we get to the part I really am interested in. How long did you drive for? Four years. Okay. But you knew him even after you finished driving for him right up until? I knew Mr. Hoffa. I hadn't seen him for a long time. Then I ran into him in Detroit in 1975. We had a big convention in Detroit. We had elections. Yeah. And Mr. Hoffa had just gotten out of jail. We had two things going on in Detroit at the time. This is when Nixon let him out. Exactly. Yeah. We had two things going on. We had the convention for the elections. Right. And we had the Renaissance Center being built. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hoffa shows up in Detroit. Don't let me down because I think I know where this is going. And he decides to get nominated from the floor. Right. To run. Even though they told him not to run for president. He wasn't on the slate. Right. But even the Justice Department did not want him, want him running for president. Well, here's what, no, here's what happened. They took a poll after Mr. Hoppe was nominated and seconded, and it showed he would get 90% of the votes. Off the floor. From the rank and file. So he'd win on the first ballot, and that'd be it. He would definitely get in. Because the drivers always supported him, right? The drivers loved him. Yeah. He, he knew, they knew he was for them. So the Justice Department came to the Teamsters, and they told them, matter of fact, they went right to Tony Salerno. Yeah. And they said, if Hoffa gets elected, the U.S. Justice Department will give the Teamsters as much trouble as they can. Right. But if he doesn't get elected... They'll give them as much cooperation as they can. So it'll be hands off. Be hands off if Hoffa's not the president. You're right. Mr. Hoffa was told that. The day before he went missing, Mr. Hoffa and I had coffee together. Right. Just friendly. Because yeah, he was my old later. boss. Lucky for you didn't have coffee twenty four hours later. I said, Mr. Hoffa, a lot of people are upset with you. He said, Marvin. My people will never do anything to harm me. I'm not worried. Right. Now, people have wondered where Mr. Hoffa is. I know where he is. The Renaissance Center Hotel was being built, and they were... In Detroit. In Detroit. It's still a there. huge complex in Detroit. As big as a city. Yeah. So with it, The concrete was due to be poured in 30 days. Right. Now, to pour concrete, you have to put down wooden slabs. Right. Mr. Hoffa went missing. The next day, every Teamster carpenter in the state of Michigan, it didn't matter if he was working on a 500-suite apartment building 
right. or building somebody's recreation room. Every Teamster carpenter was called off the job to get there and get those wooden slabs done. So that the Renaissance Center cement could be poured quicker. Concrete was poured right away. Mr. Hoffa went missing. Now. How do you know he's at the bottom of the Renaissance Center? I'll tell you how I know. A few months later, next to the Renaissance Center was another hotel. Right. And you didn't have to go outside to get from one hotel to the other. There was a walkway from the roofs, from one right. roof to the other. They had a convention at the other hotel, and all the bosses were there. My job was to come there and make sure that when their booze glass was empty, I would fill it, light their cigars, run the errands. Yeah. I was there. They were there for two weeks. All phones were taken away, no right. phones. They had the meeting. Yeah. When it was over, they decided to go ahead and go across to the Renaissance. It was built at the time to go across to the Renaissance and have breakfast for just a change of uh, scenery. Right. As we're going across, we stopped. One of those at, skywalk deals you were walking at, across? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We stopped at the line leading that hotel to the Renaissance. And Tony Salerno turned around and he said, boys, say good morning to Jimmy Hoffa. Oh, shit. So there's no question in my mind. <laughs> and uh, so you truly believe what Salerno said, that he was buried right underneath that point? No question in my mind. Wow. That is mind-blowing. Now, you were a consultant on the movie Hoffa with Jack Nicholson and Danny DeVito, I, I, right? w I was a consultant... I got paid a salary. Right. I went down there for the movie. They filmed a lot of it in Michigan, right? All of it. Yeah. Jack Nicholson did a terrific job. Playing him? Did a great job playing him. Danny DeVito, who played a part. Yeah. And was the director of the movie. Yeah. He was a rotten SOB. No kidding, huh? A miserable SOB. Well, it wasn't a height issue. You two were the same size. I'm actually, I'm a little taller. You're a little taller than Danny DeVito? I think wow. that, I well, that might have been the issue then. Could have been. Yeah. Now, I went up to him one time and I said, Mr. DeVito, it didn't happen that way. Right. He said, and Danny DeVito's character in the movie doesn't even exist in real life. There was no such person as Danny DeVito in the movie. Oh. In real life. Right. He was in the movie. I said, it didn't happen that way. He said, mind your own business. You're getting paid. I'll call you when I need you. Yeah. Jock Nicholson came over. He put his arm around me. He says, Marvin, Hollywood is like that. Movies are like that. They change things. You're getting your money. You're getting your expenses. They're doing what they promised you. Just talk to them when they tell you. Right. Don't worry about anything else. So Nicholson was a good guy. Terrific guy. No kidding. Huh? And did he spend a lot of time with you trying to find out what Hoffa was really like and how he would speak to people, how he would carry himself? A little bit, not too much, but yeah. he was but he was a good guy. I really liked him. Because he did remind me a lot of Hoffa when I saw the movie. Where do you think he picked all that up just from watching tape and uh, the hearings, et cetera, et cetera? Probably. Yeah. He could have did a very good job. Yeah. Now, how much did they pay you to do that, by the way, if you don't mind me? Well, I don't care if you mind me asking. I'm asking. How much did they pay you? 250 a week plus expenses. Are you kidding me? No, I wish I was. 250 a week. Plus expenses. In the 50s, you look at inflation, you got more than that for driving Hoffa around. I, it was close enough. Yeah. Why would you do it for 250 a week? I had the chance to be there on the movie set. It was exciting. Right. Yeah. Boy, is there anything more Canadian than willing to do it just for the experience? That's, that's mind-blowing to me. The world is in chaos at the moment, or at least that's how it can seem. If you're wondering the same thing, renowned philosopher and author Dr. Stephen Hicks can help in his podcast, Open College, on the Possibly Correct Network. Listen as Dr. Hicks helps make sense of the madness by taking an in-depth look into how postmodernism is affecting the world we live in and your very lives without you even realizing it. Subscribe to the Open College Podcast by going to www.opencollegepodcast.com and follow the show on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Minds.com and Gab for all the latest news and releases. 
Now back to the podcast. Now, uh, let's talk about George Chavello. Because uh, for those of you who don't know, George Chavello was a heavyweight champion in Canada, and he boxed Muhammad Ali, what, twice? He fought him in Toronto in 1966. Right. And in Vancouver in 1972. Right. In 66, Ali was in his prime. In 66, Ali was in his prime. But he couldn't box in uh, the U.S., right? That's why they had the fight here. They right. were originally going to have it in Montreal. Right. Montreal wouldn't allow it, so they had it here. And the fight was fantastic. Muhammad hit him everything with a sledgehammer. He couldn't knock George down. Right. And George fought back, and he fought hard. And that's an uh, interesting thing, because uh, when Muhammad Ali got his license back in 71, from the, and the Supreme Court found in his favor... He fought George less than a year later, right? 72. He fought him in 72 in Vancouver. The fight went the distance. Again? Yes. He didn't Chabella get knocked down? No. George fought 97 pro fights, never off his feet. Never once? Not once. Okay, so he and Ali obviously became friends. When we had a dinner in 1988 honoring George. Yeah. Muhammad came. In Canada. He came to, and he wanted no money at all to come for George. He's at that time he would have gotten a good buck too for making an appearance. But he didn't take anything at all. And you drove him? I drove him. Fraser was in. Yvonne Durrell was in. Yeah. Floyd Patterson was in. Floyd Patterson was here too? Floyd Patterson. He was still in. alive in 88? Who, Floyd? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. And he was still in pretty good shape. He didn't get uh, he didn't get his brain trounced like the other guys did, right? He had a very smart wife. He saved his money. He did very well. Okay, good. I like to hear that because uh, a lot of the black fighters wound up with nothing. Well, he fought George in New York. It was the fight of the year. Patterson and George Chavello. Yeah, I, okay. I sat I sat right next to Sugar Ray Robinson for that fight. Who won that fight? Now we were all positive. That George won the fight. Right. But it was in New York, hometown decision. They gave, right. the, they, they gave the decision to Floyd. Uh -huh. now, now, after the fight, yeah. I went into Floyd's dressing room to congratulate him as a member of Chevallo's entourage. They said, Floyd can't talk to you now, Marv. He was in the shower and he passed out. I ran out of the dressing room and I ran into George's. I said, George. Guess what? He says, what? I says, Floyd passed out in the shower. George says, why didn't he do it in the ring? <laughs> so in other words, uh, when you look at it afterwards, Chevello really, if it got another round or two, Chevello probably would have taken him out. I don't know if he would have taken him out, but he definitely won the fight. Same thing that happened when George fought Ernie Terrell in 1965 here in Toronto. Right, right. Now, when you first met Ali, you didn't like him, right? What happened was this. We were at the Patterson fight, and we all stood at the, I lived in the Lowe's Midtown, which is right across the road from Madison Square Garden. Right. And they all stood there. During the intermission, I went to my room to get something, and who wounds up in the uh, elevator with me? Muhammad. Right. Looking sharp, wearing a beautiful suit. I introduced myself. I says, I am uh, drive Mr. Hoffa. I drive many of the uh, fighters, celebrities. You come to Toronto, here's my card, call me. I'll be glad to take you around, no charge. Right. He said, there's other people in the, ele the elevator. He says, I don't want you, I don't need you. Right. Now, but he was big in the uh, Muslims by then, right? Well, he was big in the Muslims, and he was known for being brash. Right. Now, he was here... A while later, George Foreman fought four guys in one night, one after another. And Muhammad came here as a guest with Howard Cosell. Yeah. And the day before the fight, I was at the garden where it took place, making sure everything was all right. And Muhammad was sitting there with Bundini Brown. Bundini he, Brown was a side man for years, even though he had all kinds of drug problems and stuff. Well, which ruined his uh, relationship with Muhammad when he stole Muhammad's right. belt. Right. So I walked over to Muhammad, and he said, he called me over, and he said, Marvin, 
there was other people in the elevator. I was just kidding. Yeah. I said, well, so was I. And we took hands and we became good friends. And after that, now, he came here some years later for a charity event. Right. It was held at Maple Leaf Stadium, and they had a baseball game. The Coca-Cola were the sponsors. Yeah. The president of Coca-Cola said due to the fact that they're paying for it, he won't allow me to drive Muhammad because they pay me, and with my mob connections, he didn't want me to be an employee of Coca-Cola. Right, not, even, not even for a one-hour drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I phoned to Muhammad. Yeah. He couldn't talk too well in those days. Muhammad, yeah, by then he was starting to fade. Ma, he was. Muhammad's wife called the president of Coca-Cola and said, if Marvin isn't the driver, then Muhammad doesn't come. Okay, again, how much money did you get for that gig? 500 Right, okay. Marvin, have you ever been paid, I don't know, 1100 for something? The biggest money I got yeah. was when they paid me not to go into the witness protection program. Right, okay, we're going to talk about that next time you're here, but... Uh, just sticking with the Muhammad Ali, George Chavello stuff. Now, you and George have remained friends to this day, right? George and He's I, one of my favorite people, by the way. I love George Chavello. And he loves you. Well, that's good to know. And depending upon how much he loves me, I really don't think there would be any way for me to say no. But uh, Well, take it from me. Yeah. He always spoke very highly of you. Always said you treated him very well. Well, I've always treated him with great respect. So he told me. I just liked him uh, the moment I met him. And the hands alone, you look at his hands and you say to yourself, oh, my God, if I ever did anything to offend this guy. We had a big laugh once. We were flying in the West. Right. And there we hit, we took a Air Canada plane. Yeah. And then a private four-seater to the Indian reservations. Right. While we're in the four-seater, in the front was our pilot and our guide. In the back was me and George. Right. We hit a fantastic rainstorm. Tremendous, right. humongous. Yeah. yeah. The pilot says, I've lost air contact and I've lost vision. I'm going in for a crash landing. Yeah, too bad Hoffa wasn't on the plane. Yeah. He would have made the guy <laughs> land it on time. George says to me, Weasel, our buddy Rocky Marciano got killed in a private plane crash. What are we going to do? I says, George, there's Rocky now. He's got wings. I, right. lean, I lean back and I close my eyes and I says to myself, what the good Lord wants that's what's going to happen. And I wasn't scared. Yeah. Anyway, we survived it. Another time we faced death, we're in Saskatchewan. George went to speak to a hockey school called Notre Dame. Right. We get picked up by a camera crew, and they take us to the school, and we come to a big field. Yeah. And the driver says, I made a mistake. The school's on the other side of the field. Right. All turn around and go right back. So he wanted you guys to walk across the field. Well, here's what happened. George says it was snowing lightly. Yeah. He says, it's a nice brisk day. Marvin and I will take a walk. Right. I says, mistake. You'll take the walk. Marvin staying with the camera crew. Right. George got out of the van. Yeah. Opened up the back door, picked me up and said, you'll love the walk. Right. Now, there were signs, we found out later, they were posted quicksand. You couldn't in see In Saskatchewan? It. Correct. In that field. <laughs> as we're crossing, as, as we're crossing, the field, field, I, I, right. I, I've, I've got the pictures. As, as we're crossing, crossing George, George disappears. disappears. Yeah. yeah. What the yeah. hell? I look here, he's below the ground. I go, what the heck? I go to help him out. See, that's the beauty of being with a heavyweight, because uh, if you both walk into quicksand, you can always stand on him and get the hell out. Well, He's going to go down a lot quicker than you are, Marvin. I went down. 
Yeah. Now, George is like this. On the plane, he had no power. Right. Here he did. He said to me, hold on to me. I'll get, it out of, I'll get us out of this. We were about 30 yards out. It took us two hours. to. Get, we had to go down to solid ground. Right. Then get up and breathe. Go down to solid ground. Go up and breathe. It took us close to two hours to get back to land. Well, let me ask you a question. The guy who drove to the other side of the field to pick you up, in the course of two hours, was he not curious? He was taking pictures of it. No I've, kidding. He was. I'll find them and give them what to What an Sophia. asshole. I've, I've got the pictures. They got pictures of me and George crawling there, crawling right. to safety. No kidding. So, uh, so he got you out of that. You've crawled to safety. You know, I can't think of anything more embarrassing than uh, falling, you know, dying. Falling and dying into quicksand in Saskatchewan. It's a good thing you got out of that. I, I could. Uh, Nobody I, will believe it, by the way. And, and happens. Well, I've got the picture to prove it. Oh, I believe you. Yeah. You haven't told any lies. Trust yeah. me. Uh, we checked every single one of your stories before we brought you here, and every single one of your stories is the truth. That's because it is. I know. That's why I want to bring you back. Thank you. Because there's even more to discuss. I mean, the fact that you were an informer for the OPP. By the way, you shouldn't let the guy call the book the Weasel. Well, it just I, looks bad. I mean, I know it's your nickname, but, you know, listen, the informant. That's what they decided. You know how I, how I got together with them? The police helper? There's a million other names. I know. Here's how I got together with this uh, author. Mm -hmm. He went to the OPP. He wanted to do a story on Johnny Papalia. Yeah. Who's Johnny Papalia? Johnny I didn't heard, heard you mention that name. You never heard Johnny Papalia? No, who's he? Johnny Papalia was one of the biggest mafia members in Canada. Okay. Was he a Montreal uh, guy? Hamilton. Oh, okay. Hamilton or Montreal, I figured. So he went to the OPP if they could help him. Right. They said, we'll do better than that. We have a guy that works for us that grew up with Johnny Papalia. We'll put you together with him. Yeah. So they asked me to assist him. I met with the guy. When he researched me, he found me more interesting than Johnny Papalia. This is Adrian Humphreys, the author of the book. Exactly. Yeah. And by the way, we're going to end on this note. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to step out on a limb here and hazard a guess as to what you got for doing the book. Five hundred bucks and two weeks. Very close. Yeah, it's your standard price. Mm -hmm. <laughs> by the way, we got them for nothing, which uh, is a five hundredth of what uh, Marvin usually charges. Thanks, buddy. It was a real pleasure to have you here. Had a great time. Fantastic. Anytime you want me back, I'll be well, glad to come. I need you to live to 86. I don't care if you die a week after we do the next one, but I need you to live until we get you back here. I promise. Promise? Yeah, I give you my word. All right, that's a good deal. Probably I'm back in two years. All right, pal, thanks a million. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for I mean, a uh, million, million years. You're listening to You Too with Mike Bullard on the Possibly Correct Network. The king of spontaneity, former host of Open Mic with Mike Bullard, legendary comedian Mike Bullard is back. Stay up to date with the latest from Mike and the podcast by following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Minds.com and Gab or navigate to www.u2mikebullard.com. While you're online, please show your support for the show by leaving a review on your favorite media player. You can check out all of our podcasts by following Possibly Correct on Minds.com.